Hey guys, welcome back to Home Built, and this week we are back on the Frankenhauler. guys welcome back and those who were watching a couple of weeks ago will see that i started work on my 1954 f600 truck starting to repair the rust uh, this is my frankenhauler build where i am combining the 1954 f600 with a 1995 toyota coaster bus uh, to make it a nice reliable car transporter to take my crazy vehicles all over the country that uh, will just run and uh, and work. It's not going to be a, uh, a drag car. It's not going to be anything super fast. And uh, last week, last episode, I announced I was going to make it a patina build. Now, did that stir up a can of worms? But uh, if you missed it, I'll put a link up above so you can catch up and uh, do all the things, like, subscribe, and, uh, and comment. All of that stuff helps out the channel and really uh, helps out the mysterious algorithm. Now... Like I mentioned, wow, did mentioning it being a patina build stir up a can of worms? There are so many opinions out there about um, the, the, uh, the patina builds and the different ways that I should build my vehicles. And um, like I mentioned, this is going to, this already has some really cool patina on the outside, but um, it, uh, the inside is going to be immaculate. I will have, uh, everything is going to be completely buttoned up, nice and tight and, uh, and tidy. Uh, it's gonna have air conditioning, it's gonna have cruise control, it's gonna have um, all the comforts while still looking like an old truck on the inside. It's just going to be uh, updated and more comfortable. People really seem to be thrown by this patina thing and, uh, and, and ultimately about how I build my vehicles. But it was the same thing when I announced that I wasn't gonna paint the Alfa Ferrari red. And there were people who just blew up and ran away and I'm, I'm never watching your videos again because it's not the way I want it. But I'm, they're my vehicles and I build them the way that I want them. And uh, I like a bit of everything. There's, I'm not a one brand person, I, I like old stuff, primarily, but uh, from different eras, different brands, different countries, as you've seen. So uh, this is the way that I'm going to build it. And uh, with that, it means that, uh, first of all, I need to get rid of the rust because there is not gonna be any rust left on this despite the fact it's going to be have patina. It's not gonna have any rust. So uh, last week I was working on this panel here, which is actually the internal panel uh, for the top of the roof and uh, unfortunately it got a uh, um, basically the roof ha at some stage of its life got all dented in and uh, the water seeped through sat in the roof created rust holes the water seeped through and then sat around this top edge of the truck and rusted it out um, I was always wondering why thinking somebody jumped on the roof uh, there were a couple of comments that uh, were quite fair is that this lived its life in South Australia and uh, as it would have been a farm truck, quite likely is things like hay season when they were uh, um, collecting all the bales of hay, they would have loaded up the back of the truck and probably chucked them on the roof as well and just it was just a, it was just a utilitarian farm truck. It wasn't that it was sort of jumped on and, and, uh, and specifically abused, it was just, that's, what they was, that's how they used them, they just used every part of it and uh, yeah, unfortunately that's killed my roof. So uh, in any case, I started this a couple of weeks ago and uh, this week I'm going to finish it and try and aim to get at least this top edge of the roof done this week. We'll see how that goes. So here I loosely start with cutting a panel to shape and once I'm happy with it, I mark around the edge and then cut it out with the angle grinder hold it in place with magnets, and then start tacking with the TIG. Now I need to go through and planish the tacks because the tacks actually shrink the metals and planishing actually sort of squishes that back out into shape again.
Then I like to go through and do a long run of just TIG welding it and planish it all back out again to uh, get it back to shape. And this takes a couple of times, so sort of grind off a bit of the surface, planish it out, and depending on how long you want to spend doing this is to whether you can actually get a file finish or not. Just getting a nice clean patch is far enough for me. I'm now using a separate piece for the edge with the shrinker stretcher to get it into shape. And same again, tack it on, and once I'm happy with the tacks, then I can just TIG the entire length in one hit, or mostly one hit. And once I'm happy with it, I go over the entire thing with the DA sander just to give it a nice even finish. All right, so this is gonna be a much more complicated piece because it curves in this direction as well as in this direction. So it's got this compound curve. Uh, as you can see there, there's quite a curve in it. So uh, I'm gonna have a go at using the stump and some uh, plastic mallets and just see if I can bash something close to that shape. And this is just a little snapshot of the amount of work and backwards and forwards it takes to make one of these reverse curve shapes. All right, so you can see what I did here. Um, at first I had to fold for this front edge and realized it was just gonna be way too hard to be able to get the shape into this piece with, a, um, with the curves in both directions because this curves in that way and also over. So you can see I stretched this front edge to keep this curve and uh, keep it curving in all directions. And then a lot of hammer and dolly work, etc. cetera. And uh, I've got a patch there that's gonna look pretty good. So now, like always, cut out the old stuff, weld in the new. So you can see here after every tack, I make sure that all of the edges are perfectly level with each other. It's tedious, but it's the only way to get a really nice even patch. So you can see I've patched in a lot of this area in here now. Um, I just put a tiny little patch in around here. It's a bit of a pain. For some of these places where there's just an individual hole just sitting out, there's another one there and uh, another one here. Uh, what I'm gonna use is I'm gonna use this tool. So this is a magnet with a uh, copper head on it. And basically what this does is this is a heat sink and the weld will not stick to it. So I can stick that up from underneath and uh, it's got an adjuster here so I can adjust it in and out to uh, magnetically hold it up underneath my work so that the uh, welder won't blow through but it also won't stick so I can just sort of uh, weld up some of these holes. So I'll uh, show you how that works now. I discovered this tool on a previous build and it's super handy so I'll leave a link to something similar in the description below. All right, and as you can see, it's quite effective. So that is uh, all fixed up all around that mount for the uh, sun visor. And uh, you can just see up in here, uh, that's the last sort of main bit of this panel to repair. So that's another compound curve. So it's gonna be a little bit of playing around to get that right, but uh, I'll have a little bit of a play with uh, bashing it and uh, shrink and stretcher and stuff like that to make a shape. Let's just finish that up and uh, see where we go from there. After a whole lot of panel beating, I managed to get a piece that uh, fits nicely in there with the compound curve. So now let's uh, trim it out and fit it in. 
and cool this panel. Mostly done. All right, so after um, a couple of days of patching now, and I've got this whole panel mostly ready to be able to uh, be reinstalled. Now you can see there's some messed up edges and things like that. I can sort of sort that out later. What it means now is I need to go further and uh, fix this lip here. Now this is very ugly, this internal part. So first things first, I'm gonna cut it all off and uh, see how bad it is underneath. So I've cut the top lip off all the way along and uh, you can sort of see through to the outside on some of these bits. So there was a couple of layers that have been sort of clamped together here and uh, um, basically I've trimmed it all down. I'm going to clean it all up and, uh, and then make a new lip on the inside. But I think the first thing I need to do is start having a look at the window frame and making sure that is good, repaired and solid before I look at re remaking anything on the inside that will actually cover that all up. All right, so there is rust the pretty much the entire way around the top edge of the screen. But I think I can remake this with just some 90 degree angle on the shrinker stretcher, so let's do that. Much easier to clean up the metal before I start folding and shaping it. And this old guillotine has really come in handy. Uh, it was well worth picking up, but it is pretty scary for an old clunky machine. And these lengths are not long enough, but they're still too long for my little break. And it's backwards and forwards, just refining the shape on the shrinker stretcher. All right, so a bit of time on the stretcher, and uh, so I stretched both edges of this piece, and now I have the perfect curve of the top of the window. And um, what I'm gonna do now is, like I've done before, trim out a section and replace this bit and uh, just keep working my way along. Right, and that, that section welded in quite nicely. I actually went through and just spot touched up a lot of the uh, holes and there's uh, uh, now I've ground it back, there's a few pinholes there I'm gonna go back over and uh, just weld in those holes rather than trying to cut out a patch and make a patch and all the rest of it. I'm just tidying it up like that and that is making it quite nice. That was as long of a run as I could do with my, uh, my bender. So I've got another piece here and I'm gonna do another piece to this corner and then I'll do a separate piece for that corner. Well, that is the window surround mostly done. Um, I haven't actually joined where I've uh, done these little connections yet, just because there's still a little bit of flexibility in there. I need to test it with the window first. So I'll get to get the window out, lay it in place, and just see how good my shape is with the glass.
All right, so I've sat the old windscreen back in again just to make sure that all the shape is correct. I've got a couple of spaces sitting under the windscreen to hold it sort of roughly in place of where the rubber will hold it. And, and what I'm looking for is making sure that the gap is really nice all the way around the screen because of the style of rubber this is. It's the, the pinch rubber that clip in. Um, it needs to be a, a reasonable fit. So uh, I am very happy with that. Well, we're getting there. We are slowly tackling the rust and uh, yeah, I've just put a quick coat of etch primer around there. But that's all the time I've got this week. Um, it's a short week with uh, Easter, but hopefully I can get some more done next week. I'm still waiting on parts for the Alpha. Uh, I think I've sorted out some things with the steering, so I will deal with that next time. But um, for now, that's what we've got. So I think it means it's time for Fun Facts with Mrs. Jeff. Hey guys, Henry Ford married Clara Bryant on the 11th of April, 1888. Now he worked at the Edison Illuminating Company and he worked his way out to become chief engineer. However, he did spend all of his spare time in a small home workshop experimenting with engines. His first engine spluttered to life on Christmas Eve, 1893, famously while his wife Clara was cooking Christmas dinner. Henry set the small engine on the kitchen sink and he used a wire from the kitchen light bulb for the ignition. Henry spun the flywheel while Clara poured petrol into the intake valve. What a woman. Also, this was the year that their only son, Etza, was born. The original kitchen sink engine still exists and can be viewed at the Henry Ford Museum of American Innovation in Dearborn, Michigan. All right, well, it was a short one this week, like I said, but uh, I am very quickly getting through the rust on this cab and um, it means that it's uh, going quite quickly, really, because uh, the other stuff I think should be, uh, should be the fun bit is, uh, is doing the actual cab swap. So um, we'll get there on the, uh, on the cab, but uh, for the time being, uh, I've got to thank you for, uh, to Rob Ship who sent me a UK number plate. He sort of sent me a letter saying that he noticed we had a lot of American and Canadian plates, yes. but uh, very little done. And he got this one actually made up. It's pretty cool. Thank you so much. <laughs> really cool. So very, uh, thank you very much to, uh, to Rob for that. Yeah, I think that's everything. Jeff's going to keep plugging away with the rust. Um, like and subscribe. And if you want to help him out, become a Patreon. See the videos a day early. No ads. And we're really appreciative. All right. We'll see you next time. Bye, guys. See you, guys. On the 11th of April, 1888. So Henry Ford, he started out... <laughs> His first motor engine spluttered. That's what you've got. His first motor. Our oh, motor. Nope. The original kitchen sink engine still exists and can be viewed at the Henry Ford Amer Museum of American Invasion.